Hello, happy to be here with Professor Robert Bakers of Bristol University. Um, Professor Bakers is a distinguished historian of the modern East-West encounter. He has uh, published a best-selling Empire Made Me, An Englishman in Rift in Shanghai. Um, today I would like to talk about the scramble for China, foreign devils in the Qing Empire, 1832-1914. A book which I enjoyed very much, um, and I think that makes it these two of us, and now Chris Patton and myself are among the uh, readers who I enjoyed this book very, very much. Um, I think it's a wonderful book, very well researched, full of insightful details, um, very well written also, revealing the intellectual discipline and further research which we have put into this subject for the past several decades, at least three decades probably. Um, but also um, written in the sense that some of it reads like detective fiction or a spy thriller. Um, parts of it are about international intrigue and diplomatic brinkmanship. Mm -hmm. And so all of that coming together I think will make this a classic uh, that will be read and enjoyed and referred to by students and academics alike for many years to come. Um, I have a number of questions which I would like to ask. Um, the first one is, um, why tackle this particular story? Mm -hmm. What I mean is, some might assert that this story has been told before by John Fairbank, by Jonathan Spence, by others in histories of Shanghai, Hong Kong, the treaty ports, and so forth. Yes, it's true, it's quite an old fashioned book. And one thing I became aware of when I was doing it was, in one sense, it's, a, it's an old fashioned book. Te uh, retelling a narrative that was in some ways very familiar. But I was writing it 80 years after John Fairbank did the bulk of his research for mm -hmm. his first book, and a s almost a century since H.B. Morse yeah. wrote his International Relations of the Chinese Empire. And I was writing it with uh, access to a very wide range of archives that neither of them actually had access to. They did have access at the time to material. And one of the great things about working on China in the last 25 years, since China reopened, um, has been the steady opening up of archives in China itself. Um, so when I first went to Shanghai uh, to do research in 1991, I went to the Shanghai Municipal Archives. They, uh, they let me in. They gave me a cup of tea, they took my name, they took a photograph, I think. They said how wonderful it was for visiting scholars like myself to come along, and no, I couldn't look at anything whatsoever. <laughs> and still a few years later, it was effectively closed, even though I managed to look at things. But now there are at least 30,000 files that I can access uh, on my film in the archive. Now, Fairbank and Morse and, and other people have access of one sort to, to materials. But I've been able to go further than that because I'm interested in people uh, in, a set, in a way which I don't think they are. And these big archives which are now open have enabled me to get at uh, individual stories, personnel files, disciplinary files, uh, intestate files. So um, it is an old fashioned story. Um, but uh, there's a new fashion way of, of being able to tell it. Uh, another answer would be that I don't think it's ever been more relevant to tell the story. Mm -hmm. Because here we are, China's strong um, and economically more and more powerful. Um, but since about, about 1991, its young people have been taught uh, for their entire uh, educational career this story of China's humiliation at the hands of Western imperialism and how the Chinese Communist Party led them to liberation from that and made China strong and um, self-respecting again. And in the UK, this story is not known. Mm -hmm. So I think it's needed to try and inform the British and other Europeans and North Americans um, about the story which is being told about them, but also to uh, put it in in an objective framework. It's not bad, good, it's a very complicated story uh, with unpleasant and 
compensable episodes, but also a great deal of very interesting interaction and cooperation and collaboration. Um, and that's what I've tried to do with this book. So it's an old-fashioned book, but I think it's a book for our times. Indeed, and that's what attracts me to it very, very much. The very rich documentary evidence which you bring to bear on this very mm -hmm. important story. Um, what struck me is that as an old-fashioned historian, you have a thorough grasp of the, uh, the written materials, mm -hmm. the archival materials, the diplomatic history, um, the newspapers at the time, yeah. um, the personal diaries, letters, memoirs, and so forth, so on. All kinds of very rich written materials, but then also the photography. Yes. Yeah. And the visual yes. culture, the early films, the yes. 19th, early 20th century films about China, yes. or made in China by yeah. Westerners. But then also, um, the stone China that Westerners constructed, yeah. the bunds they built, yeah. the banks they built, uh, yeah, the military infrastructure, the lighthouses, and so forth and so on. Yeah. And also the symbolism of space, yeah. the way in which monuments and cemeteries and crosses and churches and so forth reflect value systems mm -hmm. and interpretations of the landscape. Um, but also you know, the very small personal collections, the, uh, you know, the postcards that people have in their family, yeah. Yeah. homes. Famous stamps, yeah. clothes they wore, or clothes that grandfather wore. Um, I've never ever seen that many different kinds of years come together to tell this particular story. Yeah. Um, so that in a way brings me also to uh, my next question, which is um, the archaeology of the project and the archaeology mm. of knowledge that Robert Baker explains. So what is Robert Baker's kind of you know, genealogy or archaeology of knowledge, as it were? that brought you to look at the story in this particular way. What I mean is that yes, 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 an yeah. intellectual project, of course, yeah. is something very objective that we construct yes. through education yes. and yes. systematic knowledge building mm. in, a, in, a, in a very public and supervised manner because people who come before us are teachers, you know, yes. instructors, yes. And drivers yes. in that direction. But I think in many ways there's also something very private and yes. personal and instinctive that brings us to these particular topics. The story for me starts as a 16-year-old mm -hmm. in a small English town in Petersfield. Uh, I was in boarding school, and every Sunday we used to get kicked out of the school. To go and, walk. and I spent my time in a local bookshop mm -hmm. where I acquired uh, in about a dozen paperback translations from the Chinese, which belonged to a man uh, called John Hammersley. I know nothing about him. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he died. Um, and the, the books were given to the bookshop or, or whatever. I bought them all, and I just, this was Angus Graham's Poets of the Late Town, but also um, much more recent materials, such as David Goodwin's book, Beijing Street Voices, about the Democracy and War Movement. Um, and here is this whole new world of China for me. China, I, I spent a long time with this, this translated world of China. Um, and I began a Mandarin degree. Uh, that didn't go particularly well because I was always a better historian, I realised, and a linguist. Uh, but towards the end of my, my history undergraduate degree, which was straightforward early modern, mainly early modern and modern European history, I had a decision to make about what I would do uh, for a PhD, which I wanted to do. And on the one hand, I thought I would do something on early modern Europe. But perhaps I could do China, because I had reasonable Mandarin, mm -hmm. and there were big topics available in China. If I did something in modern European history, I would get half an English parish, parish for 10 years. But I could have very big projects with China. And I designed one around representations of China and their changes. Because as an undergraduate at the School of Oriental and African Studies, I had this wonderful privileged access to this enormous library, open shelf library. And now I encountered, as a, I had my second encounter with books on a shelf. And books on shelves. And in particular, it was a book called How England Saved China, which I just found when I was, instead of learning Mandarin, I was obviously just wandering the shelves. And I thought, what does this mean that somebody writes a book called How England Saved China? Uh, and it's, uh, it's written by a missionary, the name is, I think it's McGowan, um, and it's, it's an account of how Christianity saved China. Uh, but, but that title and all of that suggested about relationships uh, from his point of view uh, very much inspired me to design a project about 
relate, uh, representations of China in Britain and how they changed. And I've been exploring those similar questions ever since. Um, what began as a diplomatic history project for my first book, this one, Britain in China, actually became a project about the British in China. Because I realized that to understand what was happening in the 1920s, I had to go to China, as it were. I had to look at British power in China to understand uh, British diplomats and diplomatic policy. And I got very involved in this rich archival material that I started looking at. And often I was the first person looking at the material and looking at it in this way. And British businesses, uh, British missionary societies, but although I was interested in the policy of missions in the 1920s, I was always much more interested in people and how archival accidents meant that you had this direct route through paper into somebody's life, sometimes heartbreaking circumstances, loneliness in China in the 1930s. And that type of material attracted me very, uh, very strongly. Um, so my second book was uh, about one of these individuals whose papers spoke to me very directly, who I pursued across archives for about 15, 10, 15 years, at least one of us um, but then I thought with this third book, I would widen the scope again, mm -hmm. um, still populate it, because this is what most interests me is people, and what they do with what they have, where they are, and when, um, predicament. Um, so Tinkler interested me, um, but I thought, hang on, I, I want the, the back story, <laughs> I want the wider story. And um, I took it further back than I originally intended to, to 1832. Uh, my work would mostly be in the 1920s and 1930s. But all was populated by these, these individuals. So is there also an agenda of self-understanding? Trying to understand why right? there was that first moment of fascination? The people? The people. The way they think? The decisions they make? I mean, in some ways, I'm, I'm not quite a historian, I don't know, because it, it is that individual circumstance mm -hmm. and predicament which much, much more grabs my attention. Mm -hmm. um, I, want, I, you know, I aim to make the contributions to, to, to our knowledge and understanding mm -hmm. of, of modern China and modern China's place in a colonial world um, and its contestation of its, of its predicament. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I, I'm very interested in um, trying to understand why people make the decisions they do. And I spent a, a, three years of my childhood in Hong Kong uh, as a child of a flight sergeant in, in the Air Force. Um, but I'm, I'm not really sure that, that might sound as though it should feed into this, this agenda. But I have a, a lived experience of late colonialism mm -hmm. as the privileged child of, of a man who's actually socially quite low at that time and wasn't an officer. Um, but uh, it's actually it's, it's books and archives which have really driven me. I should like to ask you about the title, The Scramble mm. for China, which obviously echoes another half more famous title, yeah. The Scramble for Africa. Um, it, is, it is obviously a title which is very relevant to the dossier and to the project, mm. uh, which reveals what was going on between the European powers in China, and it's also a very catchy title, yeah. which is also a very useful thing to do if you're yeah. an author. Uh, but I wonder if, if you had any doubts about perhaps particular implications of the title, because the concept of scramble, as it is applied in African context, is very different. Africa was never an empire. Um, mm -hmm. Africa started being colonized much earlier. Um, the east coast of Africa had been exposed and to some extent colonized by another world civilization, mm -hmm. Arab civilization, yeah. since the yeah. 8th century, 9th century. Um, are you concerned perhaps about unfortunate implications or no, thoughts no. that the title might occasion? Um, no, I don't think so. What attracted me to the title, yes, it was catchy and snappy. Um, we've long worked with. Um, the scramble for concessions to this, to this, to this 
described the, in this moment in the, the mid-late 1890s, when after the, the, the Sino-Japanese War um, and the German siege of Jiaozhou, Qing, became Qingdao, um, a number of European powers tried to leap in and extract new concessions. And, uh, the French seized this bit, and the British got way high way, and the, the, the Italians, why, 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 where are we? Yeah. Um, uh, the Italians were rebuffed, um, but lots of others did quite well out of it. Um, but the more I looked into the material, and the more I looked at the, the British mindset in particular, but the, the British are the avant the avant guard. Um, the others come in after them because the British generally did the job and they never really shared the spoils. Um, but I came again and again to um, to documents about men in a hurry, in a hurry to get in, to get to China, to, to get into this new port, to try and corner this market. They're never quite ready for events still, events, events overtake them, so they have to struggle to catch up. They're also struggling to catch up a lot of the time because uh, China is resilient. Uh, Chinese merchants are resilient. Chinese economy is resilient. So just as the Europeans think they have an advantage, they're wrong-footed. And they have to try something else. And they have to run around and try something else. So for me, um, that it, it, it's a snappy title, but it conveys something of the fact that this was never really settled Flat century as portrayed um, as a century of national humiliation, as something in which there was power and weakness, in which there was you know, arrogance and humiliation, in which there were foreigners and there were Chinese. It's a much more interactive process, um, in which, which is always on the move. Now, you might say that's, that's sort of asinine, the situation is always on the move, fluxes and fluxes is the, is the state of things. But I think if we're trying to understand that this period, I think we have to understand that it, it's, at times it's manic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's manic in the 1890s, it's manic in 1901. As it was in Africa. Yes, 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 yes. But it was manic in the early 1860s. So I think Scramble, for me, conveys that. And conveys also the fact that the uh, China's experience is not out with the rest of the world. That uh, scholars uh, of European colonial history often don't really properly link China into their stories. And scholars of Chinese history for a long time didn't bother with colonialism, but they'd had enough of it. So in the 1980s and the 1990s in particular, they didn't do it. It was done on the mainland, and, 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 and so it lost currency, it was uh, compromised. Issue. But China is a very important part of the European colonial story. Uh, and other scholars have, have also made that, that point. It's a very important part of European politics in the late 1890s and early 1900s. So for me, the scramble for China puts it back into that same set of European developments, which take different forms um, at different times in different parts of the world. But it's about the, the globalizing sort of world of European power and its interactions with non-European worlds in the, the 19th and early 20th centuries in particular. But no, China wasn't a blank slate, and was Africa as a dynamic place uh, in, a, in a whole range of, of different ways. Um, and China is also not the only Asian power, which is you know, fighting and grappling with European pressure. And it's by no means the, the least successful of them. It's by, um, it does pretty well in the country. One well, final question, uh, Professor Bickers. Um, what's your not next project? What's the next book that we can expect from Robert Bickers? Well, I am going to write a scramble, uh, a sequel to the scramble for China. I'm going to bring the story through the 20th century. Mm -hmm. uh, but before I do that, I'm actually going to write a book about uh, a lighthouse. A lighthouse built on the China coast uh, in 1883, the tallest light in Asia, uh, at a place which the Europeans call Breaker Point, near Shantung, Swa Tau. Uh, and what happened there in 1932, uh, when two European light keepers were kidnapped by uh, Chinese communist guerrillas. Uh, and the, the book is
is about why they were kidnapped, what happened to them, what happened to many of the other people involved in what became quite a complex story, but also why they were there and who they were. Because this single, seemingly quite clear-cut, black and white image, um, this site of European colonial power, which is how it was viewed, a lighthouse which helps a globalizing world, it doesn't help the people of China, um, and uh, was the, the home of these two men who were kidnapped as a blow against British imperialism, um, turns out to be something very, very different and much more complex and much more rooted in the, uh, the entanglements of the everyday, the entanglements between men and women and men and men, men of different races and nationalities and speak different languages and different views of the world and how it should work. So, a lighthouse next. Thank you, Tyler. Life and death in the shadow of a Chinese lighthouse. I shall look forward to uh, life and death in the shadow of a Chinese lighthouse and the scramble for China part two. Part two. Thank you. Thank you very much.